All right, so I need to take a day off to process my thoughts on this World War III thing. We're gonna make some inferences today and we're gonna analyze the data in a way that nobody else does. We're gonna share our thoughts with you on everything under the sun. This is gonna be a very extensive analysis of the goings on in the Middle East and of course the Ukrainian war theater as well, as well as all things SHTF, okay? We're gonna talk about the Gaza Strip, how it's a microcosm for the rest of the world, how it is an example of how cities are or aren't going to function after the crap hits the fan. There is no better example than that city. If you really wanna know what's gonna happen after a full-blown nuclear exchange, look no further than what is happening in Gaza, only it's gonna be 10 times worse because their collectivist mindset prevents them from descending into total chaos where we'll probably tear each other limb from limb long before we starve to death. Now, I gotta say guys, this is going to be a probably a very extensive video. I'm gonna be talking about all kinds of divergent topics. I'm gonna be going on tangents, but it's all very important if you really wanna understand what is going on right now. All I'll say, if you don't have much time, is to double, if not triple, your preparedness efforts because I went to the gun store yesterday I got myself some ammo and boy, over a dollar per round for 223 ammo. It is getting absolutely insane. The price of ammo has skyrocketed 39% in just the past week alone. So get a load of this. This is what's going down. As far as I can tell, it appears as though they're trying to get the THAAD and Patriot missile batteries in place prior to doing any sort of Gaza invasion because what's gonna happen after the Gaza invasion is it's going to rile up all the uh, Iranian-backed militias, not all of which get along with Hamas, none of which I would say fundamentally care about the plight of the Palestinian, much less the Gazan people, nor do Arabic or Muslim countries, at least their leadership class, they don't really care about the plight of the Gazan people and the Palestinians. Uh, the people there, of course, who are protesting obviously do. They want homogeneity. They want solidarity. They want the coming together of Shiites and Muslims, lots of them. However, in the upper echelons, they view each other as apostates. They fight with one another. There's a lot of infighting within the Muslim world. And the same thing with the Western world. They only care about the Palestinians and the Gazans insofar as it's politically instrumental towards their end. So you're going to hear a lot of lip service to that issue. Unfortunately, right now, Gaza is a case study for how it's going to look, for how every city is going to look post mutually assured destruction nuclear war. Look no further than that city, okay? But let me, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I got a ton of stuff to talk about, including insider information that I got to share with you guys. So please just stick around. Now, the rumor on the street is they got to get these THAAD missile defense systems in place in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Jordan, Iraq, United Arab Emirates, and Qatar prior to the invasion of Gaza. Why? Because chances are this is going to rile up all the militias, like I said, and of course this is to put Iran on notice. What this is is mission creep towards war with Iran. Can they succeed in a ground invasion against Iran? It is very unlikely. We're probably years out from them having the capabilities to do that. What they can do is get in a shooting match and of course the risk of that is is that things can potentially go nuclear because many people suspect, myself included, that Iran Iran already has nuclear capabilities or in the very least uh, has the ability to quickly uh, convert their fissionable material and put it on a bomb. Okay, now why do they need these anti-ballistic missile uh, defense systems in place if it's just about the Gaza Strip? Okay, so clearly the United States is leapfrogging over Israel using this as an excuse to justify more intervention in the Middle East in the same way they did 9-11. I mean, this is exactly the same uh, right out of that playbook, okay? CIA playbook, you get your 9-11 situation, you exploit the crisis for as much as you can, you use it as justification to go invade a country that had nothing to do with it, and uh, the same thing is going to happen here. They're using the, the uh, terrorist attacks but committed by Hamas against Israel to justify broader involvement in the Middle East. It, this is not that complicated, okay? But what you need to understand about the Iranians is they are getting their equipment ready. All IRGC, underground missile and drone bases, and remember, 
They, everything that the Iranians have is underground. They've been planning for this forever, okay? They have extensive underground, deep underground military complexes that you could hit with nuclear weapons and not destroy. Nuclear bunker busting, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to, to destroy everything that Iran has to offer. And unfortunately, because the U.S. is relegated to fighting the fort that is Iran with ships, resupply is going to be difficult. And now we know why they've been hoarding a lot of their best weapons and not wanting to give them all to Ukraine, because this region is absolutely geopolitically strategic for national security, especially in light of the fact that the Russian oil is potentially removed from our markets, even though there's a lot of ways around that. There's a lot of moving pieces here, guys. I'm going to try to stay on point, but the way my brain works is trying to factor all these things in at once and communicate them all to you is not very easy. But so what we know is that the uh, IRGC underground missile and drone bases along the Persian Gulf and Sea of Oman coast have all been moved to an offensive posture in, in response to the expansion of the U.S. military presence in the region. We also have the commander of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard saying that Iran will not hesitate to launch an attack on Israel if ordered. Remember, the threat here is that Iran has a nuclear deterrent already which is undisclosed. Where did they get it? Did they get it from the Russians? Well, that's a very complicated conversation. Everybody thinks that the Iranians and the Russians are like this, but the more I learn about that situation, the more you learn that many are allies of convenience, okay? And not necessarily um, going to be allies indefinitely, but for the time being, militarily, there is some benefit for them being allied. But... In the long run, one has to wonder, would the flood of Iranian oil into the market, would there be big players who don't want that? Because Iran has a ton of oil. I think they might even have more oil than Iraq. If that oil was to make its way to the market and not be sanctioned, the Chinese would love that. Okay, The Chinese want cheap oil. Who doesn't want cheap oil? The Russians, the Saudis. All these things factor in. Again, yes. Gaza is a major situation that is going to rile up all the crazy militia groups throughout the region, and it's going to create all kinds of uh, uh, chaos and probably mostly isolated attacks across the world, not just in the Middle East. But that's not the big play here. The big play is about uh, what it always has been, who controls all the resources in that region. So never take your eyes off that. That's why they're sending General Frank McKenzie and uh, leading officers James Glynn, uh, Glynn, a three-star Marine Corps general who previously headed the Marine Special Operations and was involved against the war against ISIS in Iraq. So they're sending these guys because uh, they know what this is about. This, this is the same old story, getting a rerun, okay? And even if you look at Hamas, where did they get all their weapons? Well, they got all these javelin weapons. Now they're fighting the Israelis, or they're about to in the coming ground offensive with American-made weapons. Same old story we've heard many, many times before. Now, according to this commander of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, he says that the Iron Dome is only actually 30% effective. And I was having a conversation with someone via email. And one thing to keep in mind is that the, it's not so much that we don't have the missiles to replenish missile defense systems. It's that you need to be able to reload them fast enough. So what often will happen if you want to overwhelm a missile defense system is you first will throw a bunch of decoys at it, a bunch of low-yielding decoys, and then once they, uh, you know, blow their load on that, that's when you send in the real missiles and try to neutralize the defense systems. They are very concerned that Iran and its proxies have amassed a very large arsenal of missiles that will easily overwhelm Israel and will easily overwhelm uh, all of the major warship activity. They're not sending all these warships there to get hostages. I mean, come on. I mean, there was Vietnam hostages for years after the war ended. Were they sending all kinds of warships and all this kind of stuff? No, that's just uh, a convenient alibi for getting themselves into position for going to war with Iran. As crazy as that sounds, they know they're never gonna be able to do a ground offensive. 
But what they can't have happen is the normalization of relations between the Iranians and the Saudis. The Iranians trying to drive a wedge because, of course, that means Sunnis, Shiites getting together, unifying against the Western world. They don't want that. They want the Sunnis to align themselves with the, the secular Zionists, if you will, and, uh, and basically just have a technocratic free-for-all petro-industrial military oil industrial complex orgy in that region into perpetuity and just completely cut the Iranians out. That's kind of what they want. That's what I'm guessing is going on here. Now, the Russians factor in because they have interests in Syria. They have military equipment there. They have a military base, and they're now allowing the Iranians to bring in their equipment through there, in some ways taunting the Israelis to, hey, okay, you've been targeting Syria this, these last few nights. You know, okay, you've been hitting Syria, you've been hitting Damascus, hitting Aleppo. Well, you know, we're going to let the Iranians bring their stuff through us, through here, whatever that might be. And uh, if you target us, of course, then it's war between Israel and Russia. Now, a lot of people, again, think that there's an enmity between Russia and Israel. And while there is to a certain extent, because Israel is a proxy of the United States, one has to remember, and apparently this, I didn't know about this before, but Benjamin Netanyahu and Vladimir Putin were actually very close friends. So you see, or at least pen pals will say, um, I don't know the, the nature of the, the actual relationship, but you can see how this is a very, very tangled web that's being woven here. Now, before I proceed further and before I forget about this, I have to talk about what is going on in the Gaza Strip. Because as preppers, we need to understand that what is happening there is exactly what is going to happen in a full-scale nuclear conflict for every single city. You see, Gaza is completely supplied by the outside world. Well, guess what? So is every single other city. There is no major metropolis on the planet that grows its own food, produces its own energy, and uh, it is just self-rejuvenating and self-regenerating. There is no city on earth that does that. What is happening in Gaza right now is a clear example of how it's going to be if we go Mad Max, if everybody starts throwing nukes up in the air, okay? They have no power. They have no fuel, and I know there's stuff being thrown around by the IDF saying that there's 500,000 gallons of fuel that Hamas is sitting on. If that was true, they would have blown that up years ago. You really got to think right now, okay? Because there's propaganda on both sides. And I'm going to talk about Hezbollah and Israel in a second. I got some thoughts on that that nobody else is talking about either. So, no, they have no fuel. They have toxic water that is making people sick. There's cholera outbreaks. There's not enough medicine, there's not enough anesthetic, and boy do they need anesthetic. These people are burning through medical equipment. The UN Security Council is saying that um, their sources there are going to have to leave in 24 hours because they're going to run out of stuff. You have 20 trucks coming through every other day, 20 trucks for a population of 2 million. I, I did all the math in my head with the tonnage and I came out with the number 5% and I just made a tweet about it a few days ago. I said, 20 trucks will prov uh, provide roughly 4% of the daily needs, daily needs for 2 million people, okay? This is how much it takes to run a city. One city of 2 million people takes hundreds of fully loaded trucks of goods every single day. They've allowed 20 trucks in, I think 34 now, because a couple more came through, um, since this thing began several weeks ago. So th they, are, they are stretched very, very thin. And then today, the UN Security Council came out and basically said the exact same thing that I did. They say that 20 trucks supply roughly 4% of the daily supplies. So I was off by 1%. But this is a reminder, okay? Their hospitals are blacked out. They're completely bombed out into oblivion. They have no food, I'm assuming. Food is very, very limited. But one thing they do have is a common sense of purpose, camaraderie, a collectivist mindset, something we absolutely will not have here. This is why the cities in North America in a grid-down world would be absolutely 
chaotic. Because in addition to have it, having to deal with all these supply shortages, they would be tearing themselves limb from limb before they were even dying of starvation. That's how we do things here. Okay, we've seen how people act, used to act on Black Friday back in the day. Well, just multiply that by 10 when they can't get water, when they start to suffer from what I call mortal thirst, mortal hunger. Okay, we haven't seen nothing yet. We are such a selfish individualistic society and this is not me throwing shade on us here in the west yes we've done some great things but let's face it we are an entitled lot aren't we so when it all breaks down expect it to be much worse you're not going to see people putting their lives on the line to rescue people at least i don't think if it's full-blown mad max chaos because people are going to be very concerned about whether or not the government is going to continue now where should I start next? I just wanted to make that point because you really could do a case study on Gaza right now. And it's like what every other city would be, you know, minus the, well, probably with the bombardment. You look at Gaza and they're talking, they're making a comparison now that the amount of ordnance that's been dropped is the equivalent of a Hiroshima bomb or the equivalent of everything that was dropped in Afghanistan for, what was it, like 10 years or something like that. So it really is. That, that's what it would be. That's what a post-nuclear city would look like. The only thing missing is the radiation, okay? So if you want to know what it's going to be like, that's what it's going to be like. Now, the only reason why it's like that, because they have closed borders and they're basically closed in there. It's an open air prison. It's no, uh, you know, there's no debate about that. According to Lindsey Graham, this is his, this is his astute analysis, okay? And understand that the U.S. is right now preparing to emergency evacuate 600,000 people from Israel. My only question is, apparently there's 200,000 dual citizens, so what do you guys think? Do you think that if you uh, have the benefit of being a dual citizen, do you think you should just be able to jump countries because of war starts? Or do you think you should have to stay there and fight for your country? Or do you think that taxpayers from the United States should pay for you to be able to fly back or evacuate you? Let me know what your thoughts are on that in the comment section below. Lindsey Graham says, we have two major armed conflicts going on in the world. Russia's barbaric invasion of Ukraine and Hamas barbaric attack on the innocent civilians of Israel. Both Areas need additional funding so that wars do not escalate and American troops do not have to be involved. So what he's saying is either you give us money or you give us our children to send, or you give us your children to send off to war. I mean, that, that says it all right there. You either give us money, give us a blank check, okay, or we're making a military draft. That's exactly what he's saying. Okay, now I know Lindsey Graham, the biggest chicken hawk there is around, but, you know, he's speaking not only on behalf of himself, all right? Now, we have Syria attacking the Golan Heights. This obviously, and, and some groups within Syria, I don't know which groups, because there's numerous factions fighting there, but Syria is attacking the Golan Heights. Um, this is in response, likely, to Israel's attacks there. And you'll notice that Israel and Hezbollah have been duking it out on the border, but it hasn't went parabolic yet. Now, one thing you should take note of when analyzing the propaganda on the Hezbollah side is that every fighter that dies, they report. And if you're on social media, you'll see there's these elaborate pictures, and they're really trying to humanize every soldier that dies. That's great. But you have to ask yourself, why isn't the IDF doing that? Because we know they've suffered almost an equivalent amount of casualties, as far as I know, maybe slightly less. But the last I heard, in the very least, and this was two days ago, they had suffered 40 deaths already by the hands of Hezbollah. So if that's true, why aren't they humanizing those fighters in the way that Hezbollah is? Is Hezbollah trying to provide a justification to its supporters to encourage Lebanon to enter this war. Look, we know Lebanon is eventually going to be brought into the war. That's a given at this point. Everybody, you know, that was a given from day one, in my personal opinion. Um, they're just setting it up. They got to get all the missile defense in there because they are genuinely concerned about the Iranian capability to overwhelm their missile defense. And if you look at some of the exercises that have been run in the past, I always forget the name. I think it was called the Millennium Challenge. This was in the early 2000s, okay? This is when Iran was 
much uh, less militarily capable as it is now, uh, the United States lost that, that war game, that exercise. And so I can only imagine how easily we would be overwhelmed today. And really the outcome is going to be that Israel is going to use nukes. Now, the great thing about Israel using nukes, it sounds really strange to say that sentence, but one of the things that you got to think about is that the risk of mutually assured destruction, if Israel, the odd man out, who's obviously aligned with the United States, but, you know, kind of, sort of isn't. The, the interesting thing about that is that it doesn't necessarily have to bring the American and Russian nuclear arsenals into the fight. It could be a situation where Israel fires a few nukes. Maybe Iran is able to fire a few nukes back, but that's where it ends. And so the, the real risk here, when people talk World War III, World War III in the Middle East, like I'm hearing people who didn't utter the words World War III when we were talking about Russia fighting NATO and bombs falling on Moscow and us being at the literal precipice of not just World War III, but complete nuclear annihilation. Now everybody's talking about World War III. Why? You know, I mean, Iran and Israel have enough nukes to maybe annihilate each other and cause a shitstorm in the Middle East. But unless Russia and the United States get involved in that, then it's, it's not going to be an end of the world scenario. Could it be World War III? Yes, because there's so many conflicting overlapping interests. You have the Chinese who want that cheap Iranian oil, and that's where they might in some ways diverge from Russian interests in that Russia wants the price of oil to stay high. Who doesn't want the price of oil to stay high when that's your primary export and you're the biggest export of this stuff in the world? Why wouldn't you want it to stay high? So, you know, the Russians, however, the Chinese benefit from Russia being sanctioned because then Russia can get them cheap crude, cheap natural gas and all those things. So it's a tangled web. The axis, I think that the overarching commonalities that they share, the macroeconomic commonalities that Iran, China, and Russia share will likely keep them unified as well as military, as well as having a common enemy. But I don't necessarily think a nuclear war between Israel and Iran necessarily immediately becomes a global crisis. It will in the sense that, I mean, the price of oil is going to go to 405. I'm just saying it might not go to Mad Max right away. <clears throat> so if anyone was to use a nuke, it would be Pakistan, it would be Israel, it would be Iran. If anybody was to use a nuke and it would remain relatively isolated into a given region or continent of the world, it is those players. This also absolves the United States of direct culpability in terms of utilizing nuclear weapons because Israel can say, well, we thought that our existence was under threat because we decided to eradicate thousands and thousands of children and people got really pissed off at us and they all stormed the gates and we had no choice. Okay. And it seems as though that's what, that's what Netanyahu wants <clears throat> because understand that Israelis do not like Netanyahu. And I heard the other day that part of the gripe that he has I think one of his brothers was killed by uh, either somebody, uh, maybe not, uh, this was way before Hamas. I think this was in the Yom Kippur War that his brother had died at the hands of uh, a Palestinian. And so that, you know, this is just him acting out his uh, complex that he has with them. And, uh, of course, leveraging it politically and trying to draw it out as long as possible because he knows right when the war ends, he's out. Now, a guy that age, I don't know why you wouldn't just want to throw in the towel anyways. He's, you know, pushing 75 and uh, he's getting up there in age. So I don't know, understand why this desperate desire to cling to power. Anyways, <clears throat> so we know that it, it, things are just blowing up in the Middle East. It's going to get very, very ugly. And the price of ammo is going to continue to go up. 340 bucks, okay? 340 bucks for 300 rounds of 223. I know everybody's saying, no, you got to start to reload. I get it. I got to start to reload. You bet your ass I do. 39% increase on 5.56 ammunition in the last week. You bet your ass I need to reload. There's an old, uh, old uh, fellow who I know who I want to get me to, I want to do a video with him because this guy reloads all his own stuff 
and hopefully you know he'll he'll teach us how we can do it across the board okay this guy's like old school old school Re reloads every single round all right now anyways guys that aside um that is not the only front that we need to be concerned about um we have stuff going on let's jump to what's going on in the black sea okay now apparently according to Zelensky, fire control over crimea is only a matter of time they're going to have a blank check with attackums you remember they said well we're going to send them a handful of attackums anytime they say that they're just pretty much know once the floodgates are open once they send the first one then all bets are off they're just going to keep sending and sending as much as they need. And rumors are that Russian forces are being routed in the Black Sea, so it's very likely that at some point, because you're seeing more shows of force by Typhoon fighters, by uh, the RQD-2, RQQ-4, Global Hawk, whatever the hell they're called, reconnaissance drones flying over the Black Sea, as we've seen today, was intercepted. Day after day, we're seeing these interceptions. It's only a matter of time, mark my words, we are going to see the shit go down in the Black Sea sooner than later. And when that happens, that's when you might see an Article 4, Article 5 situation. That's what everybody dreads. That's why Putin is putting the Kinzals on watch, the MiG-31s in the Black Sea. They're worried about these, all this U.S. military equipment heading into the Red Sea heading into the Persian Gulf, heading into the Mediterranean. They are very concerned that all of this military equipment getting closer and closer to the Middle East. And what does Russia have? Well, they got an air base in Syria. And they got the Iranians, who they're loosely affiliated with. The Iranians who are prepared for nuclear Armageddon. There is probably no other military in the world. Well, I shouldn't say that because we really don't know. <laughs> we don't know what's under Denver Airport. We don't know what kind of you know, tunnels Elon Musk has been digging for the government, and I'm quite sure that they're going to be well taken care of. We are not. And I want you to think about something. How we treat our enemies is how we're going to treat each other, okay? If we're not allowing humanitarian aid and they're blowing children apart, blowing their face off, blowing their limbs off, I've seen the most atrocious images and videos that I'll never be able to unsee in my life. Uh, if that's how we're treating our enemies, that's how we're going to treat ourselves. Mark my words, that's how they'll treat you. And I hope somebody clips this part out of the video because if, if you think they're going to treat us any better, that dehumanization that you see that our government has for other countries, the way that they, they just do things with impunity, that's exactly how they're going to treat us. And that's why there ain't no bunkers. That's why they ain't mailing you out any potassium iodide tablets. And uh, they just say, you know, go inside, stay inside with your 72-hour bullshit bug out bag. Well, my friends, you got to take matters into your own hands because it's a lot worse than that. Now, right now, as we speak, part of the reason why everybody is so concerned and uh, why we're seeing all kinds of stratcom military activity, that's strategic command, that's command and control planes, reconnaissance planes, uh, strata tankers, that sort of stuff. Why you're seeing all that on flight radar is partly due to the fact that they're running their annual NATO steadfast noon exercise, and that runs till October 26. Now, as I wrote in a tweet, adversarial countries may interpret this as real world instead of exercise, even if they're fully informed about the details of this in advance, on the back channels. There is a red line between Moscow and Washington. If they're going to do something crazy, they let the Russians know so it's not going to be misinterpreted, even in the current environment, especially in the current environment. However, the Russians don't really know what to make of this. Since uh, Merkel's revelations on Minsk that they basically were just using it as a stalling tactic, to uh, build up military force in Ukraine. The Russians don't trust anything we say. The world doesn't trust anything we say. And the world is watching what we're doing in the Gaza Strip. I say we because Israel is an extension of the Western countries, okay? And uh, the world's watching what we do there. The world's watching how inhumane what we are doing is, it, regardless of how atrocious and appalling the terrorist attacks might have been. Um, what we are doing is, is uh, 
is just reprehensible on so many levels. And the world sees this, okay? The rest of the world, the other 7 billion odd people watch this and they know what we're really about. And they know that we don't even know what we're about. That's why I say, when the shit goes down, they're going to turn the gun on us. Mark my words. Now, with respect to that, it should not be understated. Okay, even though all this stratcom activity is going on and it's likely related to the Steadfast Noon exercise, this has been ramping up all year, ever since the beginning of the year. Uh, since uh, I'm getting messages left and right here, I just want to check this one. Uh, the military is moving tonight. Holy shit. Um, oh, I just got a message from Joel Skousen, too. I hope he can come back on the channel because, man, we need that that man's wisdom right now more than ever. Um, what the hell was I talking about? Even though this is just an exercise, things could just, you know, accidentally go awry. And uh, as much as we've all been, been fixating on this Palestinian issue, the big play here is always with geopolitical, macroeconomics, Russia, China, and the United States. China in particular, a lot of people are thinking that they're about to make a move as well because they're moving a lot of equipment towards the Taiwan Strait as they've been doing for some time. They've been making extensive preparations towards that end. How much time do we got left on the clock here? Okay, I can't quite see there, but we're just going to have to run with it. This, this uh, might get cut off here at any time now. Um, I recently told you that the Su-27, the Russian Su-27, intercepted U.S. bombers. Or I didn't tell you this. I told you about the interception over the Black Sea. There was also an interception today over the Baltic Sea. U.S. bombers were intercepted by a Russian Su-27, Sukhoi-27. Now, this is not out of the ordinary. It was a routine interception. And uh, again... However, you know, given everything that is going on right now, there is a high possibility that, that an accident can happen. The more people you have manning the controls when you're at a higher state of readiness, the more that can go wrong. The more a guy accidentally slips and spills his coffee. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, being a, a little facetious there, but um, you know what I mean, okay? Things can happen, okay? And now we have uh, the de-ratification of the, the uh, what the hell is it called, the test ban treaty, uh, the comprehensive test ban treaty. That's out the door. They're going to start doing nuclear tests like you've never seen before. The Chinese are building nuclear missile silos. Now the Americans are like, oh, we think the Chinese have 500 nukes. Well, David Pine was on here probably six, seven months ago now, and he was talking about how they probably have over a thousand nukes, probably more than that, okay? And uh, when you're looking at comparing our capabilities with the Chinese and their industrial sector, people say, oh, they're just a paper tiger and, you know, they, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, what the Russians have shown us is that you don't have to be the most sophisticated in advance and not saying that the Chinese aren't sophisticated in advance. You look at any of their cities and uh, that'll prove that they are very technologically advanced. But it's more about good old-fashioned artillery war. That's what a conventional war is. That's what it's always been. Even with all the fancy-dancy missiles and missile defense systems, at the end of the day, it's all about artillery and putting boots on the ground. China has hundreds of millions of guys they could throw at a fight. Okay, There's no way in hell that we're defeating China in anything but a limited proxy exchange. And it's likely just going to end in a stalemate as it always does. So what you need to understand though, um, is what do we got going on here? Shit. Okay. So the Chinese defense minister was sacked today. Now, interestingly, this guy, uh, was one of the main people who overseen the rocket force, uh, the rocket force, he was one of the top commanders and uh, in the nuclear force as well. Okay, so this, I'm just going to read this for you. It was the highest level upheaval in China's military in over five years. The move comes as China is also dealing with questions about the fate of its former minister, Qin Gang, 
who disappeared from public view in late June before being replaced without explanation. So you know there's a major shakeup in their own strategic forces. The People's Liberation Army now bristles with one of the world's largest and most sophisticated missile arsenals posing a threat to U.S. forces in Asia and Taiwan. The democratically ruled island that Beijing claims as its territory in 2021, China launched 135 ballistic missiles for tests and training. This is more than the rest of the world combined in 2022. The rocket force brandished its nuclear expansion by building around 300 silos for ballistic missiles across three expanses of northern China. Now, they're building 300 silos. Most of their military their nukes are on mobile platforms. So that tells you right there that, you know, they're saying they, you know, that for the longest time, the thought was that the Chinese had about 400 nukes. Well, I mean, okay, so we, we know that they have a lot more than that. And uh, these numbers being thrown around by U.S. open source intelligence are probably way, way off. Okay, this is the Chinese we're talking about here. If anybody can keep a secret, if anybody can build an un underground doomsday bunker city, we can't keep that shit secret. Okay, the, the engineer over a few beers will spill his guts out to Ron, the Atlas survival bunker building guy. They won't do that there because there are strict consequences. The rocket force brandished its nuclear expansion by building 300 silos. Chinese officials have not publicly acknowledged the silos, but Mr. Xi has made it clear that he wants a more potent strategic deterrent. And again, we have convoys of missiles and rockets heading right now to the Taiwan Strait. Now, to top it all off, this is an email I received, uh, allegedly from a NASA insider. I, I have no reason to not believe people when they send me emails like this. It would be very strange for me. I get very few emails, believe it or not. It would be very strange for somebody to craft this elaborate story just to, you know, mess with me. You know what I'm saying? So take this with a grain of salt. And I'm going to try not to be providing any identifying information because I do not want to uh, compromise this individual's identity at all. All I can say is that they are a NASA employee with a high level of security uh, clearance. Um, they made a point to say that uh, nothing that... Okay, so this is from a relative of somebody who works at NASA, oversees projects in the billions of dollars of budgets, and uh, they had this disclosed to them by that person. This is a family member who messaged me, okay? So... This person, she just wanted me to know, they made a point to say that nothing she was telling me was cryptic or coded, but I know her well enough to read between the lines. So, okay, so this is a very close family member, hint, hint. She said that it's bad. She said that this isn't classified, but is being kept quite quiet, that there is a lot of cyber and space warfare going on, daily cyber attacks against U.S. businesses, course we've seen you know london stock exchange all kinds of attacks on the israeli government and uh, just across the board i mean even last year here in canada that mysterious roger shutdown that had people not being able to withdraw their money from atms for a day was strange enough but in terms of satellite warfare yes satellites go first okay as we've talked about before, all the satellite jamming, GPS jamming exercises, okay? So we know that that's a thing. Anyways, daily cyber attacks against U.S. businesses and a lot of shenanigans, as she put it, she seemed to be extremely worried. Oh, I said she was a she. They, I can't walk that back. She seemed extremely worried about the China-Taiwan situation. So take for that what you will, but... I would not be surprised if China makes a move when the United States is preoccupied with what's going on in the Middle East and they have something like a, what is it, like half of their, their not half, but about a, a, a third of their Navy headed to the Middle East and likely a greater commitment of their ammo and supplies to that region. This is the time there's no way the United States can fight a single front war successfully, much less, and this is not to throw shade at the United States, this is any superpower. Look what happened with Russia and Ukraine, all right? It's not nearly as easy as everybody likes to think. Um, 
Elon Musk is saying that, uh, yeah, it's looking like World War III. Well, thanks, Elon. Been saying that for a long time. According to the San Diego field office, apparently they're concerned that uh, Israel-Hamas conflict may potentially send uh, sleeper agents or uh, saboteurs over the southwestern border. You think? <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I'd say that our critical infrastructure is greatly at risk of being sabotaged at this point in time. My friends, this is the time to get squared away. This is the calm before the storm. I hate saying that because it seems like it's always a storm and... Uh, but this, this is what it is. It's just, uh, it looks like they, they got a plan to create all kinds of chaos. And unfortunately, me and you are going to have to deal with that. It's going to be on our conscience. It's going to be on our dime. And like Lindsey Graham says, if they can't get the money, they're going to create a draft. And the Gen Z are going to have guns in their hands. And that's the last generation you want waving a gun around when they're not properly trained. We're going to be doing a video in the coming days about medication and I just recently got my delivery of all kinds of meds from Jace Daly including an EpiPen including Salbutamol which is an inhaler all kinds of uh, stuff that you would need a prescription to get and yes you do get a prescription this is a certified physician why would I need all this stuff well if the shit hits the fan man if this ter place turns into Gaza then we all are going to be needing medication, all kinds of medication. You got chronic medication, you want to build up a surplus, you want antibiotics. I mean, they got it all. Zithromycin, ciprofloxacin, amoxicillin, you name it, they got it. Jace Medical, I'll post the link in the description. My friends, keep on preparing and oh yeah, make sure this is the Prepper's Medicine Bible, okay? This is the Survival Medicine Handbook, every single first aid book is all about how to get help or how to help somebody until help comes. This is how to get give help and give medical care even if you have no experience. Obviously, you know, always consult with a medical health physician if you can, but this book is all about what to do if help isn't coming. Okay guys, so we got a lot of big, big videos coming up. I hope we can continue to to do this because I just don't know at this point in time, you know, the way that uh, War Powers Acts, Emergency Powers Act work, you know, we may just go silent at some point in time. There may be a media blackout. That's what I fear the most. I think that that, I'm not gonna get into it, but I do think that our government in particular wants nothing more than to silence independent voices like my own so that they can completely dictate the narrative when things really, really kick off. But thanks for your support. I appreciate it. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and just take care, my friends. And uh, if you're religious, pray.